but um, I'm Tara Willerup, and I'm the vice chair of the Simsbury Free Library, which is where you are. The building, this building you're in, was built in 1890, and it was built by Amos Eno, who was our founder, and it was built to be a library. And um, we are also trying to be. Uh, we still have the genealogical and historical library, and we are starting to also try to do more community effort and community events. So we are welcoming you here today to see Jackson Eno will do a presentation on the history of the Simsbury Cemetery. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Good day to be indoors for a tour of the Simsbury Cemetery. Uh, we do have. We thought about going outside for a walk up the hill, but I also have copies of the walking tour on my computer. So if it doesn't look good for people, we can go through the walking tour uh, on the computer slideshow. And then you can go through the cemetery when it's a nice sunny day. <coughs> um, I have been president of the Historical Society since, or the Cemetery Association since 1977. Um, and I'm trying to think way back. You'll, but and and it's it became a. I mean, I kind of stumbled into being the, the president because I was the last person in the room when everybody else died, and the uh, uh, it's, it's been a really great pleasure for me to do this. And it's kind of a tradition that you, once you're elected president of the cemetery, you stay on until you pass away. So that's why I keep hoping that uh, I can go on for another 50 years. Uh, what I uh, wanted to do today, first of all, is just, just to thank the library for doing this because um, so much of history and what we have in Simsbury comes from our predecessors, our, our ancestors. And we go on daily so often without even thinking about why things are where they are you drive by something and you have no idea of what its history was. And this sort of thing is very, I think, good to get on uh, film and, and document so that people coming after us will also know, you know what these things were. Um, I walk around in this, this library and I'm just fascinated with the, the treasures that are in here um, that people drive by every single day. And if you have any interest in genealogy or the history of Simsbury, this is one of the places you can go. The Historical Society is another, uh, but uh, there are treasures all up and down Main Street. Um, what I just did today, there's a, what I passed out is a walking tour of the cemetery that we did a number of years ago. It has a wonderful write-up on the history of the cemetery in it that Joyce Cahill did when she was writing her book. Uh, and I used her book as, you know, when I was pulling this information together. Unfortunately, it's out of print and we can't get more, but there's some here for research. Uh, but this, uh, what, this history that's in your hands uh, is great to walk through the cemetery and, and you can see the monuments that are pictured and their little vignettes, little stories with all the information that uh, will catch you up to date on what you're looking at. We tried to pick a few of the historical uh, figures that are buried in the cemetery to highlight. Uh, I did another one a couple of years ago for the Ensign Bickford's 175th anniversary, which was primarily focused only on the, that family, the toys and the Ensigns, the Ellsworths and so forth. Um, and that one is available too if somebody is interested in, in that. So when I started preparing for today, I thought that let's do something a little different. I'm going to take you through the history book, the, which is our minute book of meetings of the, the Simsbury Cemetery Association, which was founded only in 1843, uh, 1853. Uh, and you've got the history before that in the front pages of this walking tour. Uh, so, and I thought it would be interesting to start and just go through the terms of each of the presidents that have served the Simsbury Cemetery Association. It's a not-for-profit corporation that took over the uh, virtually abandoned Simsbury Cemetery in 1853. So that's the story and the setting that uh, I'm keying you up for. Um, and the first 
picture is one I stole from right up the street. Because the, the cemetery um, was founded, it was a burying ground, was behind the first meeting house. And this is a replica of the first meeting house, as I think you probably all know, built for the 1970 tercentenary of Simsbury. But that building, or its predecessor, was located right inside the front gates of the cemetery. And I use my cue sheet here for when I need to change some pages. Pardon me, I can do most of this from memory, but... One more somewhere. Sorry for that. This is a, uh, a monument that's inside right where that original meeting house was. And it's, uh, uh, the DAR put that up as part of the uh, uh, Connecticut Tercentenary in 1935, for which we thank them very much. But uh, uh, it, when you're walking through the cemetery, it will give you a uh, uh, locations, uh, you know, you, you'll see that on the walking tour. Right uh, behind that or beside it is the first burial, Mercy Buell. Mercy Buell died July 4th, 1688. So all of the, the Simsbury Cemetery literature and records, we say the Simsbury Cemetery was founded in 1688. As you can read in the, uh, the walking tour, the uh, Grave of Mercy Buell was thought to be farther up on the hill. Uh, in colonial times, people buried people in either their own private family cemeteries outside of their homes and around their farms, or in this case, the, uh, in the center of Simsbury on the hill, because it was up higher on the hills where they was the preferred location. But when they built the, the meeting house, uh, they moved any of the original graves down the hill and put them near the two, about the two acres that was surrounding the old meeting house. Our, this picture was taken approximately, I'd say probably around 1880 or so. Just a, a neat picture that uh, we found over in the Historical Society records. But to give you an idea of about the time that the Simsbury Cemetery Association was founded, what was here? The uh, iron fence was one of the first uh, projects that the cemetery association had. Put a fence in the front, clean up the land, build the stone walls that are on each side. You can't see the one on the south side. Um, and uh, the, because the, the cemetery in its origin, or original uh, setting behind the meeting house was virtually a forest. They had brambles, cows, and whatever used to um, you know, graze in the cemetery grounds. It really was nothing, uh, this, anything that resembles this or what it has become today. And of course, this was just the other day when I drove by and saw the, uh, our cherry trees in bloom. Um, a lot of the <coughs> things that uh, the cemetery has done over the past um, will we'll, we'll walk you through, but the... Um, the, the, the fences are uh, a very important part of the downtown and you know 160 years the cemetery association has been in existence um, this is what we have today that didn't always look like that it's evolved over the years to this now our very first president was a gentleman by the name of Watson Wilcox and in 1853 he gathered a number of Simsbury residents together, uh, probably at the Congregational Church because that was the meeting house as well as the church. It evolved from being here in the center cemetery to where it is on Drake's Hill. Uh, and they had town meetings there and, the, and uh, he, he, he gathered a group of people together and 
set, created, because in Connecticut they had just recently passed a law that allowed for the establishment of cemetery associations to take over in the care of abandoned cemeteries. And so February 10, 1853, Watson Wilcox calls the first meeting of the association and it was being held at the Congregational Meeting House and said that any future meetings, notice of the meetings, would be posted on the doors of the meeting house at least five days prior to the meeting date. So for years I thought you know, maybe we should, I should post the meetings of the cemetery back on the church doors. I'm not sure they'd like me doing that. But, um, by 1854, the, this fledgling group had raised about $2,500. They built the walls that I showed you. They started the landscaping, cleaning up some of the debris that had been allowed to grow in the cemetery. Uh, Watson Wilcox had left Simsbury as a young man, went south, made a fortune in um, cotton and uh, cl uh, manufactured cloth, came back to Connecticut, and built what is now Vincent Funeral Home as his home. Built Vincent Funeral Home. He lived, here they are, <laughs> the longest drivers. Come on in. Okay. Well, it, it, uh, that house has also changed over the years as the, uh, uh, his daughter changed it, uh, and that's a whole other story. But uh, that's where Watson Wilcox lived. And this is where he's buried in the Center Cemetery. Um, and by, as I say, 1854, the subscriptions had amounted to about $2,500. And they started to procure land. Remember, the original area around that old meeting house, which had been abandoned when they built the Congregational Church, consisted of about two acres of land. So in 1854, they, they realized that they started to they, need, they could see the need for more space, for more burials. Uh, they had the foresight to start acquiring land from some of, their, uh, some of their neighbors. And they also voted that to have that uh, fence, that gate, put in front of the cemetery and have it painted. So they were, they were well on their way to uh, managing and maintaining the cemetery. And that's another picture of, not very good, of Watson Wilcox's grave. And we have a practice in the cemetery of honoring our presidents and uh, people who have put a lot of time into the cemetery by naming the roads in there after him. So we, Wilcox Way runs right in front of his grave. Our next president, William Mather, was elected in 1861. And his graves not too far from the Watson Wilcox grave, but they began doing something which we continue to do today, and one of the questions I got earlier was on pricing the, the graves, how do we do that? Well, the officers began appraising, and this is right out of the minute book, so a lot of times you'll hear me say things that aren't you know, probably appropriate. They began appraising the value of the lots, and the sexton began charging for them. That was back, in, you know, it, uh, as, as early as 1861. They also filed a claim, and this was an interesting one to me as I was reading the old uh, ancient meeting uh, history. They filed a claim against the estate of Horace Belden. Now Horace Belden was in the, uh, not the Belden that we think of from the Belden school, that was his son, gave that. But his father obviously was buried in the cemetery in the Belden plot and never paid his bill or the family never paid the bill. So they filed a claim against that estate. Well, as you'll learn in, in more as we go through this history, um, uh, that's William Mather. Watson Wilcox came back again in 1862 and stayed on his cemetery uh, until 1866. And then William Mather came back and um, in 1865, during his term, they voted to have the, text, the sexton toll the bell for, for funerals. Come on and have a seat. The, I've told Dick Curtis, our current cemetery uh, superintendent, that uh, I came across this while I was looking at the, the records, and he's got to start tolling a bell for funeral occasions. 
Then in 18, eight, December of 1870, Henry Ensign was chosen as president, and he, during his reign, they began a tree cutting uh, program, similar to what we get into do today. Uh, I, we've, every time we cut down a tree, we hear from somebody that we're doing something wrong, but uh, during, in, in 1870, Henry Ensign uh, started to cut trees on the side of the hill so that more, and, and he ordered that no more graves could be sold outside of the walls. The original walls, obviously, were now being, the area in section A and section B were, were filling up. People were beginning to go beyond the wall and start uh, using that area for, for graves. So they said no more graves sold out of there. And they also voted uh, in 1871 to move the north and the south roads. So remember there was the center road which went up, which is now an alleyway, which is a nice green space with trees on either, uh, arborvitae trees on either side. And then there are the old roads that were on the north side wall and the south side wall. Um, they, moved, they wanted, they put walls, uh, roads next to those walls. Um, they also voted in 1872 that they, they were going to have different tiers for the costs of, of graves. You could get a lot in the upper tier for $8. And if you were going to stay in section A and B, they were only $6. And a, a part of the history of the cemetery, once you buy a grave, that takes care of everything forever. There are no further charges um, for maintenance or perpetual care. The Cemetery Association, as part of its mission, provides perpetual care for all plot owners. By 1877, though, they were noticing that more and more of the land was disappearing again, and so they voted that no more than four lots could be sold to any one person. I don't know what you'd do if you had ten kids, but you could only get four lots. Um, then, Henry, after Henry, Horace Belden, the son of the Horace Belden, that we, uh, and this is the Horace Belden that we know from Belden School and uh, the, the old house that unfortunately was taken down on West Street. He was elected president, and it's the first time in our record books that we, our superintendent was noted, a guy by the name of Thomas Weed, and I believe he is the person mowing the lawn in that first picture we saw. Uh, we, he was appointed as president, and Horace Belden served only two years, then Henry Ensign came back for another 12 and it wasn't until his death that uh, uh, the next president came. But in 1879, we'd had more uh, legislation in the state. The meeting houses couldn't be used for town meetings and government purposes, so they, now we had this beautiful new probate office, so the Cemetery Association voted in 1879 that all of their meetings going forward would be held in the probate office. And that probate office is now part of the Historical Society, used to be over on Wilcox Street here, but it was moved to the Historical Society, and uh, the, the, farm, the uh, land trust is using it as their headquarters. The other interesting thing was in 1881, they voted to have water piped into the cemetery. Now, there, you think of municipal water in the 1880s in downtown Simsbury, uh, it was, to me that was revolutionary, but uh, they did it, and in 1882, they raised the price of graves. Now they were $15 a piece. So inflation's hitting everything. By October 1884, the Cemetery Association had enough money that they actually made an investment in something other than grounds maintenance and in fences and in walls. They bought a, made a $2,000 investment in Western farm mortgages through the Iowa Land Mortgage Company. I don't know whatever happened to that, but uh, hopefully it paid them back nicely. The, in 1885, they had a special meeting and voted that the Village Improvement Society of Simsbury has leave to make such improvements in the front of the cemetery as they see fit to provide, or provided that they do not change the present grade at the front. The cemetery hill, they didn't want changing. But you can see the things coming on now. The Simsbury, by one of the wonderful things to me in the cemetery, you can see the, the economy of the nation. You know, you start out with the a section A and B stones. They're simple red stone, marble slabs and things. And the 
as the economy and the industrial age is in the country is picking up, the monuments get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then we have the private mausoleums, and then we're back to today after in, we're inheritance taxes, people are back to more simplistic uh, monuments. So here we are in uh, um, saying that uh, we, you know, this, this, they were, the town was also facing what are we going to do with downtown Simsbury? It's going on still today. Uh, but they were in, 18, in 1885, there was a village improvement society for the th improvement of downtown Simsbury. It's amazing how all of the things in Simsbury are intertwined and they are recorded in these books. In 1886, we voted to do the first restoration on monuments in the cemetery. I thought my generation was the first one that did that, but it's, they voted to restore the tablets of Dudley and Timothy Woodbridge at the expense of the Cemetery Association. And those are the flat tablets right inside the front gates in section uh, A as you go up the hill. In 1889, A.T. Patterson, Alexander Thomas Patterson, was elected secretary treasurer. And this began a long line of the Patterson family members being secretaries of the association. A.T. Patterson ran Wilcox and Company, and then Patterson and Company across the street on Wilcox Street, lived in the house, which is right across here from the library, and um, was very active in town, uh, and during his lifetime ser served in the Connecticut legislature. He was on the group, the committee that built the state capitol, uh, had all kinds of experiences. 1890, the Cemetery Association voted to expand further west. So, we're, we're continually moving west. Then in December of 1890, I'm um, sorry, December of 1892, Aaron S. Chapman was elected president and some of the meetings were now authorized to be held in the post office, the Simsbury Post Office. And I was trying to think, by 1892, would that have been in the Weldon Building or was that, uh, I'm trying to think where that post office was. I, I remember it went from the Weldon Building to the Lathrop Building and uh, back and forth a few times. But anyway, we were meeting in the, in the post office. Uh, I guess we had outgrown the probate building. Um, the, during Henry Chapman's, sorry for the quality, his stone is worn so much that the pictures didn't uh, come out as well as I wanted. But in 1892, the association deeded plots of land to Amos R. Eno and J.C.E. Humphrey for beautification. They were not to be used for burial purposes. And these are at the very top of the hill. Uh, on, he bought corners. They bought the two corners. And their job was to plant uh, appropriate plantings in those corners so that they began to uh, further beautify and have planting spaces and not have everything used for uh, burial purposes. Um, in 1893, the association voted to set aside plots for those who do not have the ability or the inclination to purchase a burial plot. So now we have the, the social concern for people who don't have the well, the well with all or the, where the desire to buy burial plots. And in 1893, tacking right along behind that, they voted to raise the price now to $25 and they said the sexton is forbidden, absolutely forbidden, to dig a grave if he's not paid. So you had to pay to have your grave opened. Um, in 1894, they voted to move the wall further to incorporate more new sections. So this wall kept going up the hill, going farther and farther out, and uh, uh, it, it got added to as, as we acquired more land. In 1896, Ralph Hart Ensign was elected president of the association, our sixth president. And um, he changed the prices of the graves. Section A and B, now the earliest sections, were $5 a piece. C and D, the next sections up the hill, were $25 a piece. And the new section E was $30 a piece. Ralph, Ralph Ensign. Uh, saw the, 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 the benefits of charging for higher up on the hill. Um, another interesting thing had occurred in 1899. Graves in Section F 
were set aside for burial of Civil War soldiers from the D Joseph R. Toy post of veterans. So we now have a, a veteran section in, in, sec in Section F. And in July of 1903, also during Ralph Ensign's term as president, he started soliciting money and was able to uh, solicit a $12,000 gift from Adelaide Wilcox, daughter of Watson Wilcox, for the endowment of the Cemetery Association for the care of the Wilcox plot and the general endowment of the association. Then in January of 1909, Ralph Ensign's son, Joseph Ralph Ensign, began his term as president, serving as the longest elected president of the Cemetery Association until I came along. Um, he, uh, he raised, the first thing he did was he, he raised all plot prices by $10 across the board. That's, you know, got to get more money into this group because we're spending more and more money maintaining it. Uh, and in May of the year, his, one of his first projects was to start acquiring more land. He thought, and throughout his tenure, until his death in 1941, his tenure was to add more land to the cemetery because he could see the fact that the town was growing, the town needed more land for cemetery purposes, so it was his mission. And throughout the minute books, almost every meeting, it was where are we going to get more land, how are we going to get this place bigger, and how are we going to make it more beautiful? And um, so that, uh, one of the things that came up in May of 1909, though, was to look at other places in Simsbury for the cemetery. They actually put down um, option money to buy land down on Strattonbrook Road in Weetog and in another area that I couldn't really figure out where, but they, they were looking at other areas, assuming that they couldn't grow the cemetery much farther because the, the top of the hill in 1909 was still owned by the Amos Eno family. So the cemetery stopped right at the very crest of the hill and it was surrounded by houses and private land. And so there was no way to think about how you're gonna move it, uh, grow it anymore. Well, it, Got to make more money, so by 1910, he raised uh, Section E, the new Section E, to $40 per grave, and Section F, $30. And they uh, also went back in and started surveying all of the empty spaces in Section A and B, because they didn't want anything going to waste. In June of 1911, um, they, the cemetery was now the, uh, voted that they were the only ones allowed to open and close graves. I guess if before 1911, if you paid the sex, then you could go in and open up a grave for a member of your family. And uh, I guess that wasn't, uh, um, they didn't allow that anymore. And they, they created a new fee, which was 12, uh, $11 for putting in foundations for monuments. Before that, you could just install a monument and you didn't uh, have to uh, have any kind of a foundation underneath it. Now in 1911, they started realizing that a lot of the old monuments were toppling over because they didn't have decent foundations. The uh, April of 1912, at the land at the top of the hill, and again, more signs named for our presidents. This land at the top of the hill, the cemetery stopped right along this line here. There's A.T. Patterson's grave, but this was the height of the cemetery. And in April of 1912, um, the descendants of Amos R. Eno donated this land that's encompassed by, or enclosed by this fence or this wall to the Cemetery Association. And they, were, they stipulated that they wanted this land saved for the erection of their family monuments but Section G, which is way over on the far side, could be used for cemetery purposes. So that land was given. The cemetery now is at the top of the hill, as high up the hill as you can go, surrounded by a, a completed fence because this fence uh, at the top caught into the south side fence, uh, which you'll see later. We're in the process of moving again. Uh, uh, in 1915, they continued to raise prices. 
The old sections of A and B were now down to $7.50 a piece if you could find one. Section E was $15. Section G, the new land at the top of the hill, was $25. And they also voted that lots could be sold to non-residents of Simsbury and all monuments, plantings, and markers are to be under the direction and approval of the superintendent. Superintendent becoming more and more important to the history of the Cemetery Association. By 1917, the cash on hand at the cemetery was $1,600. They had $26,000 in investments, and they had operating receipts that year of $461. So they were you know, continuing to build on that endowment. In 1918, December of 1918, the Ellsworth family uh, donated to the cemetery uh, funds for the construction of our memorial gateway in the front, the uh, beautiful uh, gateway that sits there today. And during, because it was during World War I, they uh, decided not to do, start the construction on it, but uh, they uh, uh, gave the funds for it, and it, it didn't really get uh, uh, dedicated until after both Lemuel Ellsworth and his wife uh, passed away. In January of 1920, A.T. Patterson resigned his position as treasurer, having served as the second treasurer since Lucius Barber resigned in 1888. And at that point in time, uh, the Simsbury Bank, which was the new Simsbury Bank, which was the old Simsbury Bank, which is now part of Bank of America, uh, was hired to be the treasurer of the Simsbury Cemetery Association. And at that point in time, they had $29,000 in the endowment. In December of 1920, they voted to sell more land to John Phelps for the addition of the, his mausoleum. Uh, so the, the Phelps Mausoleum, which is about halfway up the hill on the right side, uh, was much smaller at the time. Now it's as it is today. But that didn't occur until 1921. And in 1940, uh, 19, January of 1921, they voted to sell four lots to uh, George McClen, Senator McClen, in Section G for his mausoleum. And you can see that there's no mausoleum there. After he passed away in 1932, his trustees decided not to spend the money to build the mausoleum. So. Uh, Otherwise, there would be a mausoleum there. In 1921 also, and this was a shock to me, they voted to build the receiving vault. Down in front of the cemetery in section A, there's a little brownstone building, uh, which is on the north side, where uh, the cemetery can put um, caskets for winter burials if we can't open and close graves. And I thought that had been there since the 1850s. But uh, it was 1921. They got approval from the State Board of Health to build that. Uh, 1923, uh, they contracted with the Simsbury Bank for the care and storage of the cemetery maps, records, reports, and the compensation for the superintendent now has gone to $200 a year. In 1925, the cemetery passed a resolution on the death of the superintendent at the time, J.C. Eddy, after 17 years, and E.E. Uh, e. Potter, Albert Potter, was voted to replace him, 1925. In 1930, we're now moving across the north side of Plank Hill Road. At that point in time, it was called Churchill Road. But George C. Eno offered 23 acres of land north of Churchill Road to the association for $30,000. This was in 1930. Gifts from Joseph Ensign, Horace Belden, Julia Darling, William Eno, Henry Ellsworth made that gift possible. So 23 acres on the north side of, the, of Plank Hill Road today is how we got that side of the road. They had. Uh, finally gotten some, some land to expand to. It wasn't until the 40s that they really started developing that actively, but uh, that was our lifesaver. That land went all across the top of the hill to the land that is now Central School. The memorial ball fields were included in that, that piece of property. 
We, uh, on the north side, we have a, a, a road named Leroy Circle after New Bull Leroy, who was our vice president for a number of years. Um, and these are the new sections that are currently being used. It's amazing in my lifetime I've watched all of that, all those graves go in and Dick Curtis has opened them all up. This is, if you're ever in that section of the cemetery, this tree is an elm tree. We planted it at about 12 years ago and it's thriving. So we've got a disease resistant elm and we're working on finding a disease resistant chestnut. So we'll find an appropriate place in there for that. That, that hedgeway we built on our property line to protect us from the ball fields and the activity that goes on over there. Uh, it, sometimes during the summer when they're playing baseball, we could have night funerals because the whole cemetery is lit up by those lights. <laughs> Curtis Circle is the original road that goes in the, the new section, if you will, named for the Curtis family, Dick and Lorraine Curtis, who have been involved with the cemetery for so long and are still involved as of today and more of the, 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 the new sections, all filling up very fast. You know, it's a constant, you read the old history and the constant conversations about getting more land, it never stops because that land is, is just about sold out. In 1932, middle of the Depression, they hired a landscape architect to design an alleyway for the center of the, the cemetery. Up until then, that had been a road. It was a way to get up to, into the old section, and since that area, those areas were now pretty much filled out, it was no longer needed, so they decided to beautify it. And that's what we have today, up and down the center of the cemetery. Nice, nice walkway, a little steep, probably not a good day to go walking. In 1932, January of 1932, they voted to hold the annual meeting at the new Eno Memorial Hall. And I'm saying to myself, January 1932, that building was dedicated in May of 1932, so they were in there before it was even open to the public. Well, funny how those things work. Um, then in 1932 as well, they had the first discussions about relocating Church Hill Road, Plank Hill Road. Because we now own the land north of Plank Hill Road and the land to the south of Plank Hill Road for the cemetery, where the old cemetery is, they wanted to move the road so that it would go around the cemetery and in the cemetery you wouldn't have to cross the, the highway to get to the cemetery. So that was the first conversation and that conversation went on as you'll hear in later minutes and almost for you know, 60 years, so you just kept going and going. In 1935, they voted to replace 14 old redstone markers at a cost of $80 each. The last time I replaced one, it cost 7000 So, uh, and we constantly go in and um, if it's an abandoned, I mean, the families are no longer around and nobody wants to do it, we, we select some of the ancient uh, markers and we replace them. We make them exactly duplicate of what they were. In this 1935 uh, uh, vote, they put in just plain rectangular redstone monuments. You can, you can spot them in a minute when you're walking through the cemetery. They look like just square redstone, big piece of redstone. We are restoring them or, or replacing them with exact duplicates. Uh, and it's very expensive. And we do it with, we send them to P, uh, a stone cutter in Maine who uses the old tools that they used in the 1700s. In 1937, they contracted with Granite McGovern to replace a 15 of the marble stones at a cost of $90 each. And Joe Ensign, at that point, donated $1,000 to cover the cost. In 1941, Joe Ensign dies, and Henry E. Ellsworth becomes the eighth president of the Cemetery Association. At this point in time, uh, Joe Pattison was elected to replace A.T. Pattison as secretary. So this next generation, but A.T. Pattison had been secretary since 1888. So 1888 to 1941. And Jonathan Eno was elected treasurer of the cemetery. 
They had assets at that time of a little less than $75,000. And under Henry Ellsworth's reign in 1947, they did the first solicitation of funds to people in Simsbury or families that were buried in Simsbury. And in that very first year, they raised $4,000. And by 1948, they had received almost $7,000 in gifts. The, uh, in 1948, uh, more discussions are, are being held with the town about moving Plank Hill Road uh, to join the two cemeteries together. And in January of 1950, the town and the cemetery struck a deal. And the uh, cemetery association deeded to the town 15 acres of land, which is the ball fields that are there today in the memorial pool area. And on, in a, in for that swap, the town gave the cemetery $18,000. And the cemetery used that money to purchase 22 acres to the south of Plank Hill Road, which is the land we're opening up now. And that, that was from uh, a company at the time that had purchased the 1820 house and all the property that went with the 1820 house called the Simsbury Development Company. And so the cemetery ended up with 22 acres, which about 15 acres are usable and the town got the nice 15 flat acres that would have been nice to have today. Uh, and in June um, of 1950, Henry Ellsworth passes away, and uh, John S. Ellsworth was appointed the ninth president of the Cemetery Association in February of 18, uh, 1951. In June of 1959, Richard Curtis, was appointed superintendent of the Cemetery Association. This is Richard Curtis Sr. Uh, Curtis Park is named for him. Um, but his salary was $80 a month. And in July, a month later, Albert Potter, who had been superintendent for 35 years, retired as superintendent. So this is the first of the Curtises coming in to be our superintendent. In January of 1960, the uh, cemetery had by now, total investments of 256000 Our income was $10,000 a year, and expenses were 9000 In January of 1961, we voted to proceed with the construction of a garage on the north side of Plank Hill Road for the cost of $2,500 for the maintenance building. That was not what's there today. That was the, what was known as the old Andrus House, and they, Mrs. Andrus had moved out. She was renting it from the cemetery. And they cut a hole in the, what went into her old dining room and put a garage door in it and beefed up the, the floor underneath it and so we could drive the trucks and the lawnmowers into that house. And that served as the, uh, the garage for the cemetery association and the equipment. It was getting to be harder to take care of it because there was more land to mow. We needed more mowers. We hired more people. And uh, you have to keep that stuff somewhere. In April of 1963, all graves were now raised to $50 a piece. In 1962 and 1963, various uh, land acquisitions occurred. Basically on Plank Hill Road, if you're coming up the hill on the right-hand side, there's the site of the old St. Mary's Church. Um, and that land, all the way back over to the behind the Methodist Church, was picked up in a series of a number of little land transactions. And plans uh, were done by Yard and Block for the finishing of the that the, the new section of the cemetery on the north side of uh, Plank Hill Road. By 1965, the cemetery had $372,000 in assets, income of $14,000 and $8,000 worth of expenses. So finally, they were beginning to uh, build up some, some assets. In May of 1966, Richard Curtis passed away, and Richard E. Curtis, Jr. was appointed superintendent. And he's still superintendent today. Um, in, sep in September of 1968, the cemetery voted to offer Josephine Kennedy $25,000 for her home at 8 Plank Hill Road. We subsequently bought that a few years later after she turned down that offer. The original plan was to take, buy her house, take it down, bring Plank Hill Road up to her property at 8 Plank Hill Road, and then move the Plank Hill Road again around the cemetery behind that green arbor that we built between the ball fields. The road would have gone over there, 
come out what is now Elmer's, Road, Elmer's Way by the Little League ball field, and that's where Plank Hill Road would have gone. And that's what they wanted to do, basically take off the steep part of Plank Hill Road and make it a more gradual turn up the hill and around. Mrs. Kennedy refused to sell her house, and that was pretty much the last of the, uh, the tries to relocate Plank Hill Road to get that, uh, that done. Um, the, uh, in 1969, John S. Ellsworth passes away, and his son Thomas Ellsworth becomes president. And the, uh, during his reign in 1974, they voted to construct the new garage, which we have today, $7,300 to build that, that garage. And in March of 1976, all of the graves in the cemetery were raised to $100 a piece. And in 1976, we had the theft of the Tiffany windows out of the mausoleums at the top of the hill. Then in Thomas Ellsworth passed away in March of 1977. I was the last one sitting around the table, so they appointed me as president of the Cemetery Association. Joseph Patterson, who had been, had been secretary of the Cemetery Association since 1941, retired, and his son Roger was elected secretary at the same time. So now you got these two young kids coming in with no experience in running the cemetery. Uh, you know, all of these elders sitting around watching and seeing what we were going to do with the place. So immediately I raised the prices to $150 a piece. I mean, what are you going to do? That was in 1978. The next thing we got together again in 81, we raised them to $200 a piece. And by 1984, we had a little less than $700,000 in assets. Our income was $62,000 and our expenses were $47,000. So since we're having profit, profitable years, what's the next best thing to do? You raise your prices again. So in May of 85, we raised them to $250 a piece. By May of 86, our endowment topped a million dollars for the first time. So we, we got it invested correctly. Um, in March of 1987, John Ellsworth had beaten me up for enough years, so we created a flower fund. So for $2,000, you can buy perpetual maintenance of flowers for your, your grave or for your family. Uh, and that still exists today. And the, in 1987, we, during my term, the first time, we had voted to pay to have the fence in the front painted. It hadn't been painted in years and needed to be repainted. $2,000, that's what it cost to paint that fence. In 1988, Richard Dudley Seymour, a very dear friend of the cemetery, left an estate to us of $340,000. Uh, throughout the years, we've had numerous gifts to the cemetery. I picked out just a few of the big ones, but uh, the Seymour gift was, was one of the ones that I, I needed to mention because of the size. We get one quarter of the income of this trust fund every year to help us. And by 18, 1989, our endowment exceeded just a little less than a million and a half. So what do we do? We raise the prices of graves. So we get $500 a piece for them now. We have to maintain the cemetery forever. And the older the cemetery gets, the more expensive it gets. And the more we want to do restoration to graves, the more that costs. So the long and the short of it is that comes that we have to keep charging more and keep up with inflation and everything. Uh, and our competition. You know, other, other cemeteries around were charging similar amounts, so we've raised not to be in cahoots with them, but we didn't want to be so inexpensive that people came here from out of town rather than going to the cemeteries in their, their own neighborhood. So price is not a reason to buy the cemetery grave. It's the beauty and where, you would, where your towns are. In 1991, we started all the roads in the old section of the cemetery um, were still old dirt roads. A little gravel if there was mud in the way, but basically they were all dirt. So we instituted a redo of all of the roads. They were all resurfaced with chip seal tar, and we put in new drainage to get the water out of the, the areas that it collected in. In 1991, we hired our first development director, Anzi Glover. And in, during her term, she raised $120,000 for us in one year in, in gifts. So by the end of 1991, our endowment reached uh, one, in, one and three quarters million. In 1995, we voted to build our first columbarium. And um, 
the estimated cost at the time we decided to build this was $375,000. We were able to get it done for $360,000, but uh, we had estimated three seventy-five dollars for it. We were beginning to experience many more cremations. You know, as a choice, people were being cremated rather than full being buried in the traditional old-fashioned way. We were using more land for ashes, and this year we've exceeded 50% of our burials or cremations. So it is a trend that is continuing and going on and on. So we decided to be more efficient. We needed to build a high rise. We had to do something to save our land because from the very beginning of the Cemetery Association, the one thing, the common thread that runs through all the time is more land. We need more land. We need more space because we're out of business when we're out of land. And the town is out of business because we're primarily the only cemetery or the active cemetery around. So the idea is, how can we take care of people's needs for the, the way they want to be handled in their demise? And we built this building. So, um, and I took a few pictures of that just to give you an idea of how beautiful the landscaping is. That building is just about sold out now. We've got a, a couple of nice memorial benches that have been given. Many things, again, in the cemetery have been given to, uh, to us, and we're very grateful for that. And families plant trees, and we, we mark, mark them appropriately. Um, in 1994, John E. Ellsworth, a member for 65 years, passed away in February of 1995. Joe Patterson passed away. He had been 35 years as secretary and 54 years as a member. And in September of 1996, we acquired 8 Plank Hill Road, Mrs. Kennedy's house, the one that we, she wouldn't sell to us for $25,000. We paid $210,000 for it. So, in, unfortunately, sadly, 1997, our dear friend Anzi Glover passed away. Uh, Lorraine Curtis, Anzi Glover had become not only our development director, but she became our secretary. We placed a memorial right there on the wall. If we were walking through the cemetery, I could show it to you uh, in her memory um, because of all that she had done. But Lorraine Curtis became our secretary. Lorraine Curtis had been the secretary for the superintendent of the Cemetery Association since 1959 when her father-in-law, Richard Curtis I, was appointed the, the, the superintendent. So she has been, we've naturally, we, we've had her why not make her the corporation secretary as well? So she now is the superintendent secretary and the corporation secretary. In 1997, we raised all the grave prices to $650, and our endowment was now $2.6 million. In 1997, we undertook the restoration of our historic street lamps. And there's only one of them, but there's a grand total of seven in front, two in front of the free library and five in front of the cemetery. Um, we had debated for years what to do with those. Those date back to 1928. And um, they were cracking their concrete construction. Westinghouse Electric made them. They are installed in a conduit. They're solid all the way down six feet underground. And they, that's why they don't lean. They don't, they're not twisted over the years. They're perfectly straight. But they had, the time had come. So we couldn't find a way to replace them, anything. So what do we do as a cemetery? We restore things. We don't throw them away. So we put in, um, we had hired a contractor. They, they rewired everything. Uh, we had all of the, uh, the original globes. We couldn't get any more. So we had these uh, uh, plastic ones made so that uh, they looked just like the old ones. We kept the original finials on top of them so that they're as historic as they possibly could be. Uh, but uh, they'll be there, I hope, for the next generation. Um, in February of 1999, we authorized buying number seven and number nine Plank Hill Road. They were two houses behind the maple tree. And we bought those two houses. And uh, you may remember uh, Nazarian's music studio was in one, and uh, the other house was become just a rental. 
uh, we tore those two houses down. We spent $300,000 to buy them and tear them down. And we opened up that area, moved the wall back down the hill. It had been creeping up the hill all the years to keep the cemetery away from the residential piece. Moved that wall back down the hill and opened up what's now called the Phelps section of the cemetery. We also, at that point in time, raised all graves to $800 a piece, and our endowment crossed $3 million in size. In 2000, we added irrigation to the cemetery. We had the front gates of the cemetery now painted again, and I hired my son at that time to paint them, and he charged us $3,000, which I thought was an incredible bargain, but he did not ask for more. So he charged, uh, and he's now the vice president of the cemetery, so it's going to be up to him to get them painted again. And he says he doesn't want to do it. In 2001, Joyce Cahill completed her gravestone inscription book, which I have a copy here, which is just amazing. She went through the whole cemetery, uh, located all the graves, and cross-indexed everything. So it's a wonderful resource for people doing genealogy. In 2002, the DAR under Joyce Cahill is the regent, put this plaque up in memory of Abigail Phelps, who the, the current chapter of the DAR was uh, uh, named after. Uh, the 2002 also saw um, the Walker sisters passing, I'm sorry, Walker sisters passed away in 2003, and they left us $350,000. And we've named a section of the cemetery after them as well. Um, another gift that I wanted to mention was the Duback family gave the flagpoles in the cemetery. This one's in the, uh, the old section that has the Revolutionary War flag on it. And, and this is what I was trying to get to, the um, 2005, we, uh, the DAR, I'm sorry, Paul Duback uh, raised money for a monument for all the Revolutionary War soldiers from Simsbury who were killed in action. There's quite a list of them. One of the things in this picture that I, just amazed me was the height of these trees. And if you were looked at, remember the other picture when we showed the alleyway? They're full grown now and you know really beautiful compared in just a matter of what amounts to what seven years. 2007, we also. Uh, voted to raise all of our prices to $1,250 and the Phelps section to $1,500. Endowment is $3,002,000. 2009, we voted to, this is the Walker section, it's the area to, on the south side of Plank Hill Road beyond the old, fen, the old wall. It goes all the way down to Elmer's Way and uh, we opened that all up to begin laying it out. Uh, done fair amount of battle with our neighbors. For t but this area, um, to create a new area for a cemetery, you virtually have to do what we do, which is take everything down and start all over again. And I don't know if you remember a few years ago, we took all of the trees out of the center of the cemetery because they were in danger of falling over and uh, damaging the monuments or hurting people. And we replanted the cemetery. The cemetery is there forever, but we are not, trees are not, and periodically you have to go through and do work to restore it, give it new life, let it grow again. So we've taken all the, uh, the trees out of here. We will be landscaping this area, laying it out, making it beautiful before we need to go in there and start using it so that it won't be just an empty, barren field when we start putting graves in there. It takes 10 years to get an area ready for burial. And that's what we're in the process of doing. 2010, we joined with the Historical Society. We started uh, the, the working with them on the, the White Memorial Fountain. Dr. White is buried in the cemetery. We thought it was very appropriate. And in 2011, we created www.simsburycemetery.com so that uh, if you're interested in finding out information about the cemetery or communicating with us, you can get to that and find us. And our latest project, which we just voted, this is the, you can see the columbarium at the top of the hill, and this is the area where the mausoleums are over here. We're going to open this, take this wall down. We're going to open up this whole area here. This wall is being relocated so that it goes north and south this way along the property line. And this area will all be open to the level of this 
Wilcox Road, which is here, will go in here and be a circle. And right here, the, there's a new columbarium wall, which is going to be installed because the main columbarium at the top of the hill is just about sold out. So those are the plans. Uh, Dick Curtis is in the process of moving that wall, taking that down. Get beautiful views from up there. But if you, want, if you have any desires for niches, they're going fast. And then just a couple of pictures because I thought that uh, this time of the year, the cemetery just looks gorgeous. And that's what we would be looking at if we went for a walk. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much for here. I can, anybody questions or anything? I can take questions, or if not, uh, I'll turn it back over. Yes? When you say you're going to move the wall, will the road still be here? Yes. That you can come cut through, so to speak? Yes, that road, uh, that, there it was right there. This road will still be here. Yeah. All we're doing is moving Let's see. Well, I'll go back here. From here down to where the Wilcox Road goes across here, in the middle of the, the top of the hill, it will continue into the new section here and do a little circle. And the old wall, which is right outside this building, pretty much up past, will stay up to that middle section. And then that, what we're doing is basically turning the wall so that it goes north-south where the, that area is that we're opening up. So we're going to have that all rebuilt using the, that old stone. Uh, and it'll, it'll look lovely when it's done. But it'll give us that new, that new area to begin selling some graves in. Um, we, we're, we become, we're more active than we have ever been. So it's, it's part of the process of taking care of the needs of the town. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's never been busier. We don't yet. We don't yet. But uh, I'm sure we will. Yes? I have two questions. How old was Mercy Mule when she died? I can look that up and tell you in a minute. Okay. And secondly, you said that up until the cemetery started, there were uh, people were buried in backyards or near churches or whatever. Are some of those um, say available? Are they, are there, is there a record? Uh, s slightly, but not very much. Not very much. There is a cemetery that was um, up at the town farm on uh, Walcott Road, and uh, that has been documented. Uh, obviously, there's te the, cem the Terrafield Cemetery. Is, is, uh, there's an old town cemetery as well as the church cemetery there. And then there's the Bushy Hill Cemetery out uh, in, towards West Simsbury. Uh, the original front gates, by the way, from the cemetery before the uh, new ones were built in the 1920s are at the Bushy Hill Cemetery. Those are the original cemetery gates from the 1850s. Who's responsible for the Bushy Hill? They have their own association. It's pretty much run by the Payne family. Uh, Bob, the Augusts and the Paynes. Mary Jane. When you were uh, reciting all the early uh, presidents of your association, I was thinking they're the same people who were the trustees here. I was amazed that you didn't say you met here in this building. Never met here. Never met here. Because this, I mean, uh, the, the cemetery association met on weekends when people had the time, or very late in the afternoons, and this, this was a, a public library. It was, it was busy. Buell. Mercy Buell. My trusty resource. Joyce Cahill. Let's see. How much are the grave sites now? 1,300 and 1,500. If you're in the Phelps section there. I have a question about the next one. Mercy Buell was born, she was 22 years old. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you are 
cremated and buried in a plot which is already owned by a relative, it's, it's certainly not that cost. We have, when we built the columbarium, and I'm guessing here because I don't have all my notes, uh, I think it's 2005. If you have owned a plot prior to 2005 and you're using it for cremation, then the cost is very little. Now, opening and closing it is, I'm going to say, $200. It's, it's, not, it's nothing like it. But after that date, the price went to the cost of opening and closing it for what it would be if it were a regular funeral, a, a full-size casket. So what it did was it, it discouraged people from using, coming in and buying cemetery plots to use for ashes because we had the facility for, uh, for ashes in the columbarium. And so, uh, but it, we didn't stop people and say you can't put ashes in the ground. Uh, it, it's just going to cost more. So. Yes? Um, I have a question. There's a grave site at the corner of West Street and Hot Meadow. Is that oh, a That's not a grave site. That's a mile marker. Oh, it's a mile marker? Yeah. Okay. So many miles to, I think it's New Haven? No, it's New Haven, I think. It's because this is the Route 10 went north and south, Northampton to New Haven. Okay. Yeah. And how about the one on um, Riverside Drive? Uh, was it buggy? Was it a Over buggy? on East Sweet Talk Street. East Sweet Talk that's, a, um, that's a death marker there were, where an, a person was killed in an accident and they put the monument up, as opposed to the one that's up on Plank Hill Road, which is the young lady who was killed by the cart that flipped over on her. She's actually buried there. Okay. And you, I mean, it's, what they did then was not much different than what happens today. Somebody is in a tragic car accident, people put up memorials on the side of the road. They just put up more permanent ones. You know, they had redstone carved. Yeah, yeah, he's buried in here, but the monument where, where he died is, is on the road. Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. Yes. And put them up. Uh, what happens to the old ones? We keep them. Oh, yeah. No, no, we keep them. Once I had a, a discouraging account. I read that a cemetery in England had these, um, what are they called, all back stones or whatever. It's in the guidebooks that goes, they're special to see them. Well, they also have, in, in Europe, they'll, they'll, cemeteries have reusable graves. And that's why they take the monuments and put them into, yes. Did the association ever do a cleanup of a cemetery where they move stones to reorganize? No, we put them, we've picked them back up if they've fallen over. We have, um, we, constantly, we constantly straighten them because on the hill, especially the frost moves them. Um, the, uh, it, we have not moved them or relocated them from where they were originally. Well, Mercy was, right? Mer well, Mercy was, her body was moved. That's what I'm told. I, you know, that's, I. Yeah. I only heard about half of <laughs> uh, Some cemeteries, older cemeteries, especially in Europe, they put the footstones all along the side, you know, not connected to the yes. uh, grave at all, I guess, because it's easier to mow or something like that. Well, I, I, I travel cemeteries all over the place, and the, the rules vary from here to Avon and Granby. Um, in Granby, for instance, if you buy a single plot, you can't have an upright monument. You have to buy a monument lot that is bigger. 
uh, we are very unusual for allowing the types of monuments that we allow. We've actually gone in and moved monuments to have funerals and then we put them back again, which most cemeteries would, would never let, let you do. Yes? And the sycamore trees, what's the significance of the sycamore trees? Do many of them were damaged? Well, thank you for reminding me of that too because I meant to say that during, um, those trees were uh, planted in memory of Anzi Glover and uh, uh, there's one more that comes as soon as this maple tree out here passes away. Um, we'll put another one in. They were damaged during the storms, but they seem to be coming back fine. Um, it'll be a while to see in the next couple of years if the, how crooked they grow or whatever, but they're very durable, durable trees. Um, and they were up and down Main Street along with the elm trees and everything else a million years ago. So um, the idea was to put those there. We had maple trees there from the 50s that all they don't do well with salt, and the sycamores seem to tolerate that a lot. So it was uh, in 1999 when we did the replantings, um, we put sycamores back. They're messy. <laughs> They're messy. But that's part of our history. <laughs> Anything? I really don't know where the cemetery is on Bushy Hill. Um, if you go out, it's on North Canton Road. If you go past the Bushy Hill Fire Station, oh, okay. take, take, take that right. It's down on your right. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs>